This one particular man said that growing up, he was so insecure and so nervous when it come to public speaking that he would physically shake. And he ended up becoming Asbury University's president two, two, on two different occasions. But he said that... Uh, one thing that, that really, really helped him the most was he would memorize his sermons. That is, would be quite a, quite a feat. But anyway, he said that is one of the ways that he worked through being able to, to hold the different positions and go to the different universities and get the degrees and everything that, that goes along with that. But at in, in some point in his life, he uh, says that it finally connected with him about how that verse in the Bible that says we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, that he sort of was able to connect the mind part. And uh, so what he would do, he would... Uh, would get down and pray and ask God, first of all, to help him to memorize the sermons, but uh, connect the part about his mind and talked about the significance of keeping his mind clean and, and fresh and forgiven and all that went along with that. But uh, I'm sure that there are, I have read a lot of stories down through the years where somebody maybe was in a, a similar condition and how God helped them to, to overcome. And I, I read that when I was studying 1 Peter chapter 2. And uh, I kept thinking about that and thinking about it and thinking about it. So maybe somebody needed to, to hear that today. So that did not connect with this, but I just... I thought it was a, a good story. First Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, but first I want to look at a couple of verses at the end of chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22. For me, this, this uh, is a, a prerequisite to what these the verses say here in this text. And I thought it was interesting in verse 22, it talks about purifying our souls. 1 Peter 1.22 says, Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, Love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable but imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fails, but the word of the Lord endures forever. That word is the good news that was announced to you. The interesting part to me was the actual wording in verse 22, 
that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. And the truth, of course, is, is scripture. But whether we, we read it or whether we memorize it, however we do it, it says that that is purifying to our souls, the word of God. After all, paraphrase, you have been born anew. Some versions say, say you've been born again. This one says, you have been born anew. Part of that being born anew, part of that process is, uh, Scripture tells us and talks in several different places, the importance of laying aside certain things. And so this uh, lectionary passage today is chapter 2 in 1 Peter. Uh, verse number 1 says, Rid yourselves, rid yourselves, or lay aside. Paul talks about in his writings about certain things we need to turn loose of as if it's going to in, interfere uh, with our faith and our relationship to God. There are certain things that we must turn loose of and, and get rid of in order to grow spiritually. But verse 1, lay aside. Another way to look at that is make a conscious decision to stop and no longer to be involved with. And then he gives, excuse me, a list in verse 1. It says, rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice. Malice is malignity or malevolent. Malevolent, malevolent is just uh, making an effort to, to do harm to someone or wishing to do evil to others. The second one on the list is guile, guile or deceit, trying to entrap another or treachery. The next one on the list in verse 2, insincerity, which is hypocrisies unfeigned, practices in interpersonal relationships. And then the word envy, Jealousies that lead to bitterness, we are to lay aside. The last one, all slander. Slander is evil speaking speech that puts others down like defamation, backbiting, hostility and malice of speech directed against your neighbor. So Simon Peter is saying that we need to lay those things aside for fear that they will interfere in our relationship with God. And on a positive side, verse 2, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow into salvation. I like the reference to purifying our soul. Purifying our soul and desiring the milk. Long for the pure spiritual milk so that it you may grow, so that by it you may grow into salvation. So growing into salvation and purifying our soul, we for sure need to set that aside. He said we are to long for infant or milk like an infant. 
we come to a key imperative verb, desire, as newborn babe, infants, eager for milk. So Christians are set to set their eager longings on milk, spiritual milk, so that we can grow. Spiritual milk feeds the mind and the heart. Pure milk is without deceit. Spiritual food found in God's word that by it you may grow into salvation. So he is saying to put certain things down and then take up certain things. And the result is spiritual growth. Made a little caption at the bottom. Deliverance from sin and its consequences by faith in Christ. Deliverance from sin and its consequences by faith in Christ. And then verse 3, chapter 2. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. The if indeed can be said this way. Since you did taste, Peter is reflecting on Psalm 34, 8, which says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. So in summary, Peter asked them to commit or desire to grow spiritually, and this involves ridding yourselves and desire the milk and taste and see. So something to set down and something to pick up. Verse 4, come to him a living stone. Talking about Jesus being the living stone. Though rejected by mortals yet chosen and precious in God's sight. So God done the choosing of Jesus to be the living stone. Sometimes he's rejected by mortals, but he is chosen and precious in God's sight. Peter makes the bold point that the Christian community is now the covenant people of God, successor to Old Testament Israel. <clears throat> coming is literally coming to or approaching, they came to him, talking to Jesus, and were enlightened. So Christians come to the Lord to find food for their souls and to be built up. Like church and Bible reading and prayer, and there's a long list of things that we can do. Uh, Peter changes to a different analogy to that of a building or a temple. Jesus is the living stone. Jesus is not a literal stone, but a living one, one who has life in himself and gives it to those who are his. What or why Peter introduces Jesus as a living stone because he intends to present the truth that the Christian community is God's temple. You know the verse that says, our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Jesus is starting, Jesus is the starting point of that spiritual house, the living cornerstone who gives life to all the rest of those who form the living temple. Verse 6, for it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious. And then it goes on to say, And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Adjectives modifying this stone, elect, elect, or chosen, the chief cornerstone lying at the extreme corner, the final stone 
in a building set over a gate. And the precious, whoever believes in him, will not be put to shame. That means dishonored, disgraced, disappointed. Our hope in him will be fulfilled. Verse 7, to you then who believe he is precious, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner. So the unbeliever rejects the word of God and stumbles at the word and the one who is proclaimed in the word. Eight, a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. God did not cause them to sin. It was their own personal decision. Therefore, disobedience is not ordained. The penalty for their disobedience is ordained. Verse 9, But you, talking to, to us, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's own people. Sure, Peter and Simon Peter was trying to get this across to the people then, but it's still, it is now the same for us today. You're a chosen race, verse 9, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So as we cast off those things, which are ultimately darkness, who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. And then there's four phrases that characterize his, this people. A chosen race or a chosen generation. Chosen is the same word as elect, and means sharing the same origin. So the Christian community is God's chosen people. A kingdom of priests, kings, and priests at the same time. We both reign and we serve. The individual believer is a priest not as an individual, but only as a member of the corporate priesthood, a holy nation, we are set apart from the rest of the nations as God's own people. Holy by definition as belonging to him, indwelt by him, and intended for his service. So... I think that's another way of saying that we are, well, the next one is peculiar people. Literally, a people for possession, possession of the Holy Spirit. The Christian community is for possession, means that this people exist to be God's. So we are a people that has become God's own possession. And a very important thing here, the major way we offer up spiritual sacrifices that are well-pleasing to him is he has called us, he has called us from darkness to light. The darkness is spiritual darkness, a darkness of the soul. It is the darkness of the soul that does not know God and has no hope of knowing God. Ten, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So looking back over this passage, Peter is making a bold point. The point is the Christian community has now replaced Old Testament Israel as the chosen people of God, although in continuity with the people of God. The new temple 
has replaced the old and the new priesthood replaces the old. In verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and exiles to abstain from the desires of the flesh that wage war against the soul. So Peter reminds us that we who are Christians, when they come to the Lord, they find him to be a living and life-giving stone. Jesus is the stone men rejected, but God says he is chosen and he esteems him highly. So our part in the kingdom of God says you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. Stand with me if you will. <clears throat>